So I want to finish up, hopefully we've got the time, to now talk about the, the effects on diabetes and to show you with one compelling slide. I, if I could show medical students one slide on why diabetics should not be eating carbohydrates, I'm going to show it to you now, uh, just as we're going to build up to it. In fact, it's the next slide. So now, so what happened, we changed the dietary guidelines in 1977, and we've got what's called a 20-year rule, which was developed, with, described by Campbell, a physician at Addington Hospital in Durban. In 1967, he noticed that there were 20, after you urbanized, within 20 years, diabetes rates started to rise. So here we see the 20-year rule, the diabetes rates start to rise in 1997, exactly 20 years after the dietary guidelines changed. And I draw your attention that this is an exponential increase and it is going to carry on and on and on unless we change it. We have to do something. We solve the HIV problem, we can solve diabetes. And this is the study. And the reason why it's such an important study, it was done in primates because you can't do this in humans. You couldn't do this study in humans. And it was published a few years ago and probably doesn't receive the wide attention I believe it should. And I'm going to take some time because it's a very complex study, but it is utterly crucial to understand the management of diabetes. This is, if I had one single study to, to show medical students how to treat diabetes, how to manage diabetes, this is the study. So I do apologize, it's very complex, but I'm going to try to go through it as slowly as I can. So firstly, don't look at the pictures, they're too complex. Just look at the, what I've put here, I've put the gut. And what I want you to imagine is that we have a gut here and then the gut's going to take, the, is going to absorb in foods and glucose and fats and so on. And they're going to go to the liver and then they go from the liver to the heart and the circulation and then it's going to go to the rest of the body. So that's the way these slides are shown. So this is going to tell us something about what happens when you take something in your diet and it goes from the gut to the liver. And the, the, the vein that connects the gut to the liver is called the portal vein. So we have food comes into the intestine and it's absorbed and it goes in the portal vein to the liver. So there's the portal vein. Now in humans we can't do this study. We cannot cannulate the portal vein. It's impossible to get to it. So what these people did was they put a, 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 measure, a, a cannula so that they could measure exactly what was going from the gut to the liver. And that's crucial because you can't do it in humans. You can only do it in primates. So then they knew that when you ate, they could tell exactly what was coming from the gut into the liver. And then they worked out, then they could measure in the blood coming out of the heart, that's the arteries and going to the rest of the body, exactly what was coming out of the liver and going to the rest of the body. So let's repeat. At the bottom here, we eat food, it comes into the intestine, it's then absorbed into the liver, and we measure here exactly what's coming in from the gut. And then it comes to the liver, and the liver's going to process, and it's going to store some things, and it's let other things out, and then it's going to go out into the body and go through the circulation. And when doctors look at patients with diabetes, they measure this then. They only measure this, what's happening and circulating in the bloodstream. So, what they're measuring here, now it gets very complex. You have to listen very carefully. The rate at which glucose is appearing in the blood, in the portal vein. And the analogy for me, imagine we're all sitting in a train we're going along and we come to a station and the doors open and people rush in. And that is the rate of glucose appearance. Every person who's coming in is a new glucose molecule that is coming in the doors and then we close the doors. And there are more people in the room and there's more glucose flow up to the liver. So what you see is we come to the station troops, and we open the gates and outside of is glucose derived from a high glucose diet and what you immediately notice is thousands of people storm into this room and that is the yellow line the yellow line is the arrival of all these people and they rep each of them represents a glucose molecule so that's the rate of arrival 
So what that tells us, there's a lot of people out there wanting to get onto this train, onto this, into this uh, cabin. And that's because you've eaten a high carbohydrate diet. There are a lot of people out there with glucose. What happens, but if you look at the blue lines, that is we come to the station and there, there's little glucose coming in because people have eaten, a, this, this, this is a high fat diet, so there's very little glucose. So there's little glucose coming in. We now close the doors and we head off to the next station. And at the next station, we allow more people in and we allow people off. And what happens here is that more people go off than come in. So we dispose of more people and as a consequence, the rate of appearance actually goes down. And so you can see slightly, sorry, sorry I should have said probably that less people get off than stay on. That's sorry, less people get off than stay on. And as a consequence, if you look at the top number there, for, the, for this uh, yellow line, the rate of appearance of glucose is only 30, whereas here it's 40. So, correction, that means that more people have stayed here, and that means they've been stored uh, in the liver as glucose. And we've left, 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 left out, fewer out. And then when we look, we come to another station, and we measure the glucose appearing out from the, we open the doors again and let people out, and we'll see that the amount is in fact slightly increased here. And why is that? Because now the liver has also released some glucose. So in a sense, we've now discarded more people. And it's getting complex, but what, what we see here in the endogenous glucose, this is what the liver is doing. In response to all these people rushing in, the, the liver says, oops, too much glucose. I must stop producing glucose because otherwise we're going to fill this room too much. And so here we see that the liver responds to this inrush of people by saying stop producing glucose. And so in the bottom right hand corner, we now see that the liver has reduced its glucose production. And as a consequence, this value doesn't go quite as high as it should because the liver is not producing quite as much glucose as it should. I was referring to the endogenous glucose rate of appearance uh, on the bottom right corner. And after that? And after that, to the top one, the total glucose rate of appearance into the systemic circulation. Thank you. So, what, what this shows then is that if you do not eat carbohydrates, your liver just continues to produce a little amount of carbohydrate. It just continues to produce the same amount. There's no problem, there's no hassle. Once you ingest carbohydrate, you upset the system, and all of a sudden, there's a massive increase of glucose coming into the, to the circulation. The, the, the pancreas sees this, and it must be respond by secreting insulin, one of the consequences of that is that the liver tries to reduce its glucose production, but it can't, it can't go to zero. And that's critical. Because why do we have to have this massive increase in glucose? And the answer is because the liver continues to produce too much glucose. So the, glu the liver is producing too much glucose. It can't shut it off quick enough. And as a consequence, your blood glucose concentration rises. If the liver were able to completely inhibit glucose production, it would come down here, and this glucose level would just go like that, as if you'd ingested no glucose. And that tells me that humans are not designed to take in high-carbohydrate diets because we can't inhibit glucose production. And as a consequence, our blood glucose values rise. And this then starts to cause that hyperinsulinemia and so on. So I know it's incredibly complex, but if I could summarize. If you do not eat carbohydrates, your liver is just continues to produce all the glucose your body needs. It just goes on doing its thing quite happily. The moment you take in carbohydrate, it's a crisis. The liver cannot respond. It continues to make the glucose in excess. It does not completely inhibit its production. As a consequence, your blood glucose 
and the rate of glucose appearance in the bloodstream continues to rise. And that then initiates a whole response of endocrine hormones which are toxic to the body. And I think this proves more conclusively than anything else that if you want to keep your blood glucose under control, you don't eat carbohydrates. So, their conclusions. A low carbohydrate diet causes minimal changes in the rate of glucose appearance in both the portal and the systemic circulation. It does not affect the rate of endogenous glucose production. The liver just continues to produce glucose and it causes minimal stimulation of insulin. These observations demonstrate that low carbohydrate diets cause minimal per perturbation in glucose homeostasis and pancreatic beta cell activity. And remember, beta cells secrete insulin and insulin is the problem. So if you ever want to see evidence that a low carbohydrate diet should be the diet for diabetics, this is the evidence. So this study shows that the single most important determinant of the blood glucose concentration as a meals is the amount of carbohydrate present in the ingested food, nothing else. Hence, the simplest way for anyone, including those with type 2 diabetes, to control their blood glucose concentration is to limit the amount of carbohydrate they ingest. That is shown by that study. It's obvious, but people don't understand it. But this is not the dietary advice that we promote. Instead, we tell diabetic students to eat carbohydrate and inject more insulin. When if they don't eat carbohydrates, they don't need to secrete insulin, they don't need that insulin. This insulin this worsens insulin resistance and as a direct consequence there are arterial disease. So there are a number of studies showing the benefits of a low carbohydrate in diabetes and I just to give you a very very simple study uh, I want to show you what happens if you put people on a low carbohydrate people with diabetes on a low carbohydrate diet. Remember we said the HbA1c is a predictor of what your blood glucose concentration has been for the previous three months. And so if the HbA1c is elevated, we don't think that's a good idea because it tells you, us your glucose has been high. If it's lower, that's good. And this is a Japanese study in which they measured HbA1c levels in people with severe type 2 diabetes after they'd been put onto a high carbohydrate, sorry, a high fat diet. And what you observe is that over six months, the HbA1c values came down, except for this guy. He obviously did something wrong. But by and large, the evidence shows that we can get these values from the average there would be about 11 down to 6 or 7 which is quite dramatic for most people with with diabetes that would be a good response so my point is that there is lots of firm evidence that when we follow the biology and we reduce the carbohydrate intake we can have measurable beneficial changes and you can see that even the hdl cholesterol rises as you'd predict and so, again, there are many studies showing this. I'm just showing you this one. In summary, the 30% carbohydrate diet, which is a bit higher than I would prescribe, I would advise people to eat if they're, if they're diabetic, led to a remarkable reduction in HbA1c levels, even among outpatients with a severe type 2 diabetes without any insulin therapy, hospital care, or increases in sulfonyl ureases, which are drugs used to treat diabetes. The effectiveness of this diet may be comparable to that of insulin therapy. And I mentioned yesterday that a paper was published by the Australian group, one of the newest studies in which we had a randomized controlled trial in patients with diabetes, showing that this diet reduced the, all these variables and also allowed patients to reduce their medications more effectively than any other diet. So the evidence is growing and it is strong. And I'm just giving you one very, very simple example. One of the more important voices in this condition in type 2 diabetes is Salma Hamdi, who is the medical director of the Joslin Diabetes Center, which is one of the great centers for diabetes in the world. Joslin was a man who really promoted the management of diabetes. He had extensive case records and he published them became the world authority in, in diabetes in the early 1920s and they developed the Jocelyn Diabetes Clinic because of him and that's why he's remembered. And this is Harvard Medical School as well. And this is a recent, a recent paper. I debated Dr. Hamby in Washington DC about two years ago and it was clear to me that he still was and hadn't yet bought into the low carbohydrate diet. I debated him with Gary Taubes and Jeff Volek and David Ludwig and those are three of the more important members of the low carbohydrate diet 
And we happen to think that we influence what he wrote here. And what he wrote here was the following. It is clear that we made a major mistake and recommended the increase of carbohydrate load to greater than 40% of the total calorie intake. The error should come to an end if we seriously want to reduce the obesity and diabetes epidemic. Such a move may also improve diabetes control and reduce the risk of for cardiovascular disease. Unfortunately, many physicians and dietitians across the nation are still recommending high carbohydrate intakes for patients with diabetes, a recommendation that may harm their patients more than benefit them. So here's more evidence that the traditional conventional advice may be wrong, and it's being questioned by Osama Hamdi, who is from the Jocelyn Diabetes Clinic in the North America, one of the fundamentally most important centers in the world. So I'm just going to finish up with what advice are diabetics getting in South Africa. Remember, I showed you what advice my father got in, 19, in 1990 or 1989-1990. This is a book that's just been released and it's written with the Heart Foundation and Stroke Foundation. And I believe that this lady is a registered dietitian in South Africa. And it's written for a pharmaceutical company, which is great that they should want to help our patients. But, so there are the names, Selena Mayer and Ashley Badham Thornhill. And there's the title, Cooking from the Heart. And I'm just gonna go through some of the guidelines, just very briefly. Making good choice. Eating foods that keep our blood sugar levels stable is equally important for all of us, including those who have to manage their diabetes. Well, I've shown you the way you control your blood sugar level is not to eat carbohydrate. That's the primate story. It shows it. Some foods have a bigger effect on blood sugar levels than others. The more these levels vary, the more we want to eat. This could lead to unnecessary weight gain and ultimately some lifestyle diseases such as obesity, diabetes and heart disease. It's quite important to know which foods contain carbohydrates as she's absolutely correct. They have the biggest effect on our blood sugar levels, something, something people with diabetes should always manage. So again, now she's realizing that carbohydrates, or they're realizing carbohydrates are crucial in influencing our blood sugar levels. And then she said, it's important to eat foods that will not cause blood sugar levels to rise or fall too drastically. And I've shown you what diet foods those are. Those are low-carbohydrate, high-fat foods. And then she says, carbo or they say, carbohydrates are our main source of energy, which is completely false. It's only true if you're carbohydrate adapted on a high-carbohydrate, but too much, eating too much can cause weight gain, obesity, and lifestyle diseases like diabetes. So how should you manage diabetes? Now this is kind of the core question that the person reading this book would want to know. Every person with diabetes has a unique and individual situation in terms of how they should manage their condition. There are, however, three key questions that anyone with diabetes should always ask. How healthy am I eating? How, am I doing regular exercise? What medications am I using? The combination of these three questions is the best way to control and manage diabetes effectively. And that is not true. It's simply not true. There's only one question the diabetic needs to ask. The key question is, am I restricting my carbohydrate intake? That's the only question the diabetic needs to answer. Of course they must take, do their regular exercise and need, may need to take medication. But if you want to know how healthily am I eating, for a diabetic that's the question. And we still aren't getting the message out there that this is what's important. So I apologize for this joke, but this kind of went also on Twitter recently. Jane, I'm afraid your mother has diabetes. We can cure her with a simple low carbohydrate diet. However, the guidelines tell me, the guidelines tell me, the conventional guidelines tell me I must prescribe pills, insulin, and loads of carbohydrates. So her condition will just keep getting worse. Sorry about that. So that summarizes conventional advice we know it's wrong. The evidence is clear. We shouldn't be giving that advice. We should be giving what is the unconventional advice which will save our patients. And so I'm going to just finish up with some philosophy a little bit, if you'll excuse me. And Semmelweis, as I'll show you who he was, one of the great men of medicine who discovered something which I will show you. And because his ideas were not accepted, even though he had the evidence, when people ignore the evidence that is clear, we call it the Semmelweis reflex or the Semmelweis effect. And it's a metaphor for the reflex tendency re to reject new evidence or new knowledge because it contradicts established norms, beliefs, or paradigms. 
So I'm guilty of the Semmelweis effect. So let's look at who, what Semmelweis's effect was. Here is Semmelweis. And in the 1840s, he wrote this book on the etiology concept and prophylaxis of childbed fever. And he is the man who taught us that we should wash our hands before we deliver babies, because that will reduce the incidence of childbed fever. And I was really interested in him. I was so interested in him that I wrote an article with my colleagues on him because we wanted to, to present one graph that would epitomize what he had done and what he had achieved. And this is the paper we published in Epidemiology and Infection. And again, I'm not an obstetrician, but, but because I was interested, I, I wrote the paper. And so what happened to, to, to Semmelweis was the following. He worked in the hospital in Vienna, and these are data he presented. We're on page 541, Madam Chair. Because he was one of the original epidemiologists, and he did an intervention trial in the 1840s, long before we understood epidemiolo epidemiology. And in, but he was dedicated to numbers. And what we have here is the maternal mortality in the Dublin Maternity Hospital, and those are those data, between 1788 and 1844. And maternal mortality was mainly determined by the, whether the mother got childbed fever or not, so whether she became infected after she'd given birth, because that's the high risk that if an infection is going to occur to the mother, it will occur shortly after to birth. And he compared the incidence in his own hospital the Alchemenus Krakenhaus in Vienna. And what you see is that they're almost overlapping with Dublin until just before the 18, early 1820s. And what happened at that point was that this hospital introduced the concept of autopsies. So all the medical students started to have to do autopsies at that time, and the doctors, which were not being done at Dublin. So now they started to doing autopsies and the mortality rate amongst the mothers rose. Now, of course, you say, well, how can you do autopsies on dead people and now that suddenly caused the mothers to die? It doesn't make sense. And I'll explain what happened. So that was the first thing that happened. And now you can see that the mortality has clearly risen. And so the, if you were in Vienna at this time, you really wouldn't want to have your child in the hospital because the mortality rate's a bit high. The next thing that happened was they split the, the maternity ward into two, Clinic 1 and Clinic 2. And Clinic 2 was, had only midwives in it. And do you see what happens? The mortality goes down, and dramatically down. Now, why should that happen? Why should having midwives doing the deliveries reduce the mortality to the mothers? And no one realized until later but in hindsight, what it was, the midwives were not doing autopsies. And what was happening, sorry, we'll come back to that. And they split clinic one off. And there's clinic one. Now, these are doctors who are doing autopsies who are now doing the deliveries. And you see what happened? The mortality shorts up enormously. So it's comparing this figure here to this figure here. Now, at the day they explained it by that's called miasma. There's just bad air. And the bad air is causing the mortality. And Semmelweis said, how can that be? Because the two clinics are right next door to each other. How can you have bad miasma in one and not in the other? And also, they were rotating every 24 hours. So every 24 hours, the miasma had to go jump back to the other room. And eventually, he realized that what was happening, and it was so obvious in retrospect, was that when they started doing the autopsies, the physicians were going right from the autopsy room to delivering the babies. And they were taking the, the, the bacteria from the mothers who had been killed by the bacterium, they were taking it directly to the babies and the mothers, and they were killing them. So it was a doctor-induced disease. And he said, he realized, and I haven't time to explain how he realized it, but he realized that if we can clean the doctors after they've done the autopsies, and before they examine their patients, we're going to cut the mortality. And he introduced hand washing. And the introduction of hand washing produced that dramatic effect in reducing infection rates. And then no one believed him, and he left the hospital. And what happened? 
mortality rate went straight back to where it was. So that's the Semmelweis effect. And it's obviously I've simplified the story, but here's one of the great breakthroughs in medicine and it wasn't recognized. And Semmelweis was responsible partly because he didn't publicize his information. So, so 82% of all deaths from childhood bed fever, they realized now could have been prevented if the obstetricians had adopted Semmelweis's finding and simply washed their hands. They didn't do it because they couldn't conceive that doctors were killing their patients. That's critical. We are the doctors. How can we be killing our patients? Does the same apply to those promoting the current nutritional guidelines, especially for those with insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes? We're causing ill health and we can't acknowledge it. And I finish up with, with one slide. And I don't want to be dramatic, but we, most of us have read George Orwell in 1984 when thoughts are controlled. And he writes, George Orwell writes, the whole climate of thought, the whole fo focus of this book is thought control by, by the politicians. The whole climate of thought be, will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. And this is key. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. And orthodoxy is unconsciousness. And that's the key. I'm being penalized for thinking and for asking and for challenging orthodoxy.